Uh, thank you very much, and it's a great honour and pleasure for me to be here in one of the world's most beautiful cities, uh, in a country that I think we all love. Um, unlike Ireland, you get fantastic weather, so that is a bonus for good health too. Um, I'd like to thank the interpreters for the translation services because I reckon I'm the only one in the room using them. Um, so can I thank them for um, their very efficient uh, translation service. Uh, it's an honour to be here. I've been asked to talk um, a little bit about Ireland. Uh, as you heard, I'm a former health minister in Ireland. I was health minister for six years. I was also an environment minister at a different time. And I was industry and trade and, and technology minister for seven years. So I, I come to this agenda of pharma and health from both an industrial, uh, economic and health perspective. I'm here today, however, to represent the European Steering Group, which is a multi-stakeholder group sponsored by one of the world's most innovative blue chip companies, Abvi, and I know they're one of your partners uh, here today at this prestigious conference. And uh, the purpose of the European Steering Group uh, was to make a contribution towards the sustainability of healthcare uh, in Europe. I think affordability and financial sustainability are the big issues that confront every government in Europe. The challenges are the same, uh, the issues that we have to deal with are similar, but I'm not for one moment suggesting that a one size fits all. And later I'll talk to you about some of the initiatives that we have piloted on the ground that are proving to be hugely successful. Not all innovation comes from the top down, much of it can come from the bottom up. As a recovering politician, I've had five years to reflect on some of the issues that do confront ministries. And I know there's a wonderful book by a woman called Susan Jennings, and she says that there's no perfect health system in the world, and I would share her view. We're all seeking to create perfection. None of us have got there yet, and I guess we're not going to get there very soon. The last speaker's presentation was particularly impressive because I'm a strong fan of evidence and data. And in fact, I could have used this presentation, and instead of talking about Greece, I could have spoken about Ireland, because you had some very interesting data in relation to Ireland. So I'll begin to tell you a little bit about Ireland. We're a population of 4.6 million on the periphery of Europe. When we joined the European Union in 1973, 36% of our economy was agriculture and food. Today, that's down to less than 8%. 70% of our economy is services, about 30% is agriculture uh, and manufacturing. We are home to some of the world's most biggest investments in pharmaceuticals. Nine of the top 10 companies have a major facility in Ireland. Over the last 10 years, we have attracted one of, we've, we've been one of the world's biggest attractors of biologics. And currently there's eight billion euro in investment in biologic facilities uh, in Ireland. Our pharmaceutical industry employs about 26,000 people directly and the same amount indirectly. They contribute 40 billion to our exports. We are the seventh largest exporters of pharmaceuticals in the world. They two thirds of their employees are graduates and they employ 25% of our PhD students. So why has Ireland become such a big home for pharmaceutical activity? Essentially it is because we have responded as a government uh, to the needs of an industry like pharmaceuticals. We have a 12.5% corporation tax, and even when governments change in Ireland, industrial policy remains consistent. We have R&D tax credits. We have a knowledge box. If IP is created in Ireland or any portion of the IP, you pay 6% tax. We have an education system that's very flexible to the needs of the industry, and we have a very friendly policy towards inward immigration. Uh, in Ireland, about 10 to 11% of the population are foreign. Many of them have come from other European countries, but other, others come from further afield to fill uh, the employee deficits that we may have from our own indigenous population or from the wider European population. So we understand the industry. Yes, we have paid a bit more for the drugs than many other countries, as you've seen, but we believe on balance that's been a good policy for Ireland. I'm a strong believer in health is wealth, and that a good health policy is a fantastic economic policy. And why do I say that? If you just look at countries where they have very poor health policies, 
you will see that they have very poor economies too. Uh, economic activity doesn't function if you have an unhealthy population. About 11% of our population is over the age of 65, so it's a relatively young population. In Italy, for example, about 26.5% of their population is over 65, making Italy the second oldest population in the world after Japan. And there are many countries in Europe that are not replacing themselves. Uh, thankfully, in Ireland, for many years, we never had a problem with the replacement uh, ratio. Much of it has to do with the Catholic background, although that is changing and family sizes are much smaller. So I think it's interesting to note some of the initiatives that I introduced when I was Health Minister. We have about 32 acute hospitals in Ireland, and at the time they were all performing cancer surgery. We had very poor outcomes relative to other countries. The clinicians weren't skilled, and it was bad for the patients. There was one hospital that did one breast cancer surgery in the year be before I became Minister. We consolidated all of that down into eight uh, expert or eight um, specialist centres, and already it's, we're beginning to see a huge improvement in outcomes. Was that easy to do? No. There was one part of the country where they had a poster of me saying wanted for murder because I was withdrawing the service. And I mention that because sometimes the resistance to change is not from patients, it's not from the political system, but it's rather from those that work within the health system. Very often people work in silos. We all become accustomed to being creatures of habit, to doing things the way they're always done. And because services were being withdrawn from some hospitals, local clinicians objected to that, and the politicians from those areas decided to side with the local clinicians. And the government, although we were a minority government, lost two of our deputies in one particular area. But the government held firm. And today, nobody would go back and no successive government, even though at the time the opposition opposed the plan, no successive government, and we've now two governments since, have sought to alter or change that simply because the evidence is proving how successful it has been. And I mention that because in order to do good things in health, you have to have a vision, you have to have political leadership, and you have to have a determination to see it through. Uh, if you waver on the road, you achieve nothing. Another area of reform, and I'm just going to mention a couple of things because they've been significant, is nurse prescribing. Nurse prescribing has been in place in North America for a long, long time. It wasn't in place in Ireland. Nurses, in my view, are very central to the health service. We don't equip our nurses with all of the activity they could do. They are underutilized. So I introduced nurse prescribing, and essentially a nurse can prescribe in our area of care. So if it's a psychiatric nurse, they can prescribe for psychiatric patients and so on. The nurses had to do um, a short prescribing course, but it's now incredibly popular, and it was strongly opposed, particularly by medics. It's a no-brainer, and it has genuinely transformed much of our health service and led to a much more responsive service uh, for the patient than had been the case before, waiting for the doctor to come. Um, we've also shown that nurses are conservative prescribers, contrary to the view that was being advanced. Um, they are not the liberal prescribers that many feel uh, they are. We established a Health Information and Quality Authority in Ireland. This is an independent body. It's funded by the state. And essentially it sets standards for the health service and it monitors um, and evaluates against the performance of those standards. From simple things like hygiene in hospital or clinical standards um, to the number of patients in a room some of the standards are very simple, but we had no standard setting body uh, in Ireland prior to the establishment HICWA. And that has been seen as driving huge improvements um, in the manner in which health services are performed. And they do unexpected um, inspections, and all of their reports are made public. And they work with organisations to um, improve their performance. They are also the body that's responsible for health technology assessment, and we didn't have health technology assessment uh, prior to the establishment of HICWA. I could go on and list a number um, of other reforms uh, that we introduced in Ireland, but, I, but I'll end by just mentioning one other, and that is clinical leadership. Uh, if you want doctors to change, or if you want best international practice to be implemented, it has to be led by clinicians. So we introduced a system of clinical leadership. So for example, the expert in stroke care will lead all the clinicians across the country in clinical pathways and the, the manner in which patients should be dealt with. 
For example, in stroke care, thrombolysis in Ireland is one of the highest in the world. We're saving one life a day and hundreds of disability uh, every year. We also measured uh, the performance of clinicians. The production of the data in itself has had a dramatic effect on improving performance. If one surgeon saw that um, his colleague in the same field was doing twice as many pr procedures as he was per year, that has an impact in itself, and nobody wants their peers uh, to be performing better than them. So the production of information and knowledge done through clinical leadership has had a profound impact uh, on improving the uh, performance. I'm not suggesting for one moment, by the way, that the health system in Ireland is perfect. Far from it. Um, and if many of you go there, you'll see we have long waits uh, for, for many procedures, uh, particularly for outpatient appointments at hospitals and for inpatient activity. One of the um, organizations I established is called the National Treatment Purchase Fund, and essentially that is an organization that purchases treatments for the longest waiters in private hospitals. We have a mix of public and private hospitals in Ireland. Many of the private hospitals had spare capacity, and the public hospitals um, were very much crowded uh, for the want of, uh, activ of too many patients. And that's proving high highly successful. My successor in government wound that down somewhat, but it's now been enhanced again because it was seen to be highly effective. As you know, Ireland went into a bailout in 2010. We came out of it in 2013. Uh, and during the recession years, before the bailout, the recession began late 2008, 2009. We reduced public sector pay by 18% and reduced public sector numbers by about 10%. We reached an agreement with the pharmaceutical industry on some reductions in prices, and that was done on a consensus basis. And sometimes in different countries, people say, how could you do that on a consensus basis? We do believe in a holistic approach. We do believe in agreement and consensus and not antagonism. Uh, we, you get nowhere unless you can see the perspective of the other side. And the, 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 the current government have just negotiated a new deal with the pharma industry. And Ireland pays roughly the average price in the 15 EU, EU countries, the original 15 before enlargement, which would include Greece, or 14, I suppose, because Ireland is one of the 15. The rebate is going from 4.5% to 5.25% from the 1st of June and to 5.5% from the 1st of August 2018. In particular, the agreement um, deals with how new innovation will be introduced into the Irish health system. And as far as I know, uh, the Irish Pharmaceutical Healthcare Association are happy with the agreement that has been reached, notwithstanding the fact that there are clearly price reductions. But the industry is very keen to ensure that new innovation is introduced. And of course, as a, a citizen of Ireland, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a former minister, I want to see new innovation made available to patients as quickly as possible. And lastly, I'll just mention in the context of Ireland clinical trials, we have put in place a, a very good legal and ethical framework around clinical tr trials. Um, and at the moment, we have about 45 million in cancer clinical trials underway in Ireland, and that's going to grow to 100 million in cancer alone by 2020. Um, and essentially, there, there are 14 different sites. Essentially, it's about ensuring that you go down the bureaucracy, that you get the legals to be safe, and secure, and that you have the appropriate people uh, in place to make that happen. And that's seen as a big attraction uh, for much of the pharmaceutical activity uh, that happens within our country. To the wider EU, as you know, 80% of the EU's budget today goes on chronic illness. One in six Europeans have a disability, and 10% of Europeans leave work uh, because of sickness. We lose 2% of our GDP, uh, to illness, which is about 240 billion. Every 10% rise in chronic illness reduces GDP by half of 1%. And it's from those statistics that the European Steering Group that I have the honor of chairing was born. And we are a group of multi-stakeholders, including academia, physicians, patient representatives, industry. We've engaged widely with many uh, stakeholders across the European Union from nurses' organizations to doctor organizations to industry uh, to patient groups and so on. And the purpose of the engagement is to try and reach a consensus about a way forward. We produced a white paper uh, in February, March, March of 2015, and essentially the white paper uh, makes a number of recommendations. 
but our report is based on pilot projects in 22 different countries, including a pilot project here in Greece. And I won't mention all the pilot projects, but the idea of the, of the approach is to have a bottom-up perspective. Not all good things happen this way down. A lot of fantastic innovation can happen down low at the bottom level. It requires leaders and innovators. And one project, I think, deserves special mention, and that is the issue of muscular skeletal disease in Spain. It was costing Spain about 1.7 billion a year. Uh, 21 million days were being lost from work. And a very innovative doctor called Dr. Hover um, decided to work with others, including employers and employees, around what's called early intervention clinics. And essentially, the patient is picked up very quickly. And what does that mean? There's been a 40% reduction uh, in the use of hospital resources, a 50% reduction in uh, permanent disability, a 45% improvement on return to work, and so on. And suffice it to say that there had to be investment, obviously, in more physicians and so on, uh, and physiotherapists, but suffice it to say that the return on investment is 11 to 1. For every 1 euro invested, it has shown 11 to, turn, 11 to 1 return. It's a no-brainer. That particular project has been rolled out across Spain and, and, and in the UK, and part two of our European Steering Group project is to roll it out across the EU, uh, working with employer and employee organisations to make that a reality. Now, that didn't come from a government initiative. It came from a very innovative doctor working with a team of people uh, who came forward with this approach, got people um, interested, got resources from the government to make it happen, initially seed funding, and then began to roll it out. And I mention that project because it's simple at one level, but the economics behind it proved the power of making things happen in a very organized and early intervention way. Much of the cost of healthcare is the fact that we don't pick the patients up fast enough. By the time they're picked up in the health system, their illness has become much more severe and the interventions, the health interventions required are therefore more complex. And in addition to that, there's welfare costs and so on. I believe that health is wealth, as I said, and that health is an investment. But I also believe that we need cross-ministerial approaches to some of the health projects. It's not good enough to say that health is merely the responsibility of the health minister. The welfare minister paying welfare has an interest in health. The industry minister who's, inter who's interested in productivity and industrial output has an interest in health. And above all, the finance minister who's financing the health system has an interest in health. And in the ESG, we are now going to move to a cross-budget approach. How do we make cross-budgets work? Uh, in government, everybody is so preoccupied with their own area of activity that sometimes we don't work well with colleagues in other areas. But nowhere is it more important to work in a partnership and inclusive way than in the area of healthcare with other colleagues. Education too is a role to play because clearly prevention and early intervention does require education. Ireland was the first country in the world to ban smoking in the workplace. People said it would never happen because we're quite a lawless people. And I often say if it worked in Ireland, it'll work anywhere. It's had a dramatic impact. It wasn't just the question of banning smoking in the workplace. It was accompanied by huge educational uh, initiatives to really educate and inform young people that smoking is bad for your health and that it's not the cool thing to do. And that's not to say that we've eliminated smoking. Uh, we still have a higher instance of smoking than we would like, but it's had already a dramatic impact. Um, most people that do smoke are smoking less, but the whole purpose of this is to stop people smoking and recent re research has shown that it's having a profound impact on stopping people to starting in the first instance. Abraham Lincoln once said, you can't deal with tomorrow by evading today. And we know that the population of Europe is aging. 37% of the population of Europe will be over 65 um, by 2050. It doesn't sound that complicated, but when you think of the fact that two thirds of older people tend to have a number of chronic illnesses, not just one, maybe more than one. The majority of Europeans retire in bad health, not in good health, ironically. And we can change that uh, data. We can change those statistics. We can give people a better ambition, a greater vision, by being conscious of the small things that together 
can make quite an impact. So yes, we need prevention and early intervention, but we also, we also must reorganise how we provide care. Our acute hospital system was established to deal with acute illness. Today it's dealing with chronic illness. That is not the place to deal with chronic illness. We need to move much of the activity of hospitals into the home. We have the technology to do so. Europe is very poor at using technology in healthcare. I think there's only one uh, hospital in the EU that really is genuinely technology friendly in, in the context of mobile and e-health and so on. We know too from European Commission statistics that the use of technology in healthcare can reduce costs by something like 90 billion and it can add another 90 billion to GDP. So it's a no-brainer. Many people say older people can't use technology. That is a myth. Over 50% of over 65s either use internet or email. 33% of them belong to social networks. And they are the fastest growing number of people getting technology friendly. I see today in a newspaper headline I was reading that um, Google's artificial intelligence is now going to work with a, um, a National Trust Hospital in the UK um, on a a piece of equipment, a piece of technology that's going to be able to pick up eye disease very rapidly. Um, so there are amazing things happen, happening in the world of innovation. And the issue is how do we afford that innovation? We can only afford that innovation if we change the status quo in the way we perform our services. And one of the wonderful examples that we came across in the ESG was a hospital here in Greece. Sometimes faraway hills are green, and we often don't know about the innovation and the good practice close by. And it's a hospital in Patras. I think that's how you pronounce the name. And they showed by changing their organizational structure and their procurement structure, very much a bottom-up approach with the staff, how they dramatically changed the performance of the hospital. For example, on purchasing, they were able to save 24 million over three years, reduce their infantry by 73%. By moving non-clinical tasks away from nurses, they had 800 nurses, they improved their productivity by 33%, the equivalent of 264 nurses. And they have shown that if you were to roll that out across Greece, you would save a billion annually, and you would also increase the number of nurses by between seven to 12,000. And at a time when nurses are, are in scarcity, um, I think looking at what the Patras Hospital did um, is something that we can all learn from. And how do they make it happen? They made it happen by working together in a good communication plan, getting everybody signed in to the agenda. And as I say, it didn't come from the top down. It came very much from uh, the bottom up. And it is truly an inspiring example that we in the ESG salute, and it's actually referred to in our white paper. And what was the difference in making that happen? Leadership, managerial leadership. Um, we've often a habit of thinking if the politicians could only lead, everything would be wonderful. All of us have the capacity to be leaders, whether we're hospital managers or whether we're, I think I'm, going, I'm being told here that um, my time is up, whether we're hospital managers or whether we're patients or whether we're nurses or whether we're pharma companies, we all have a role to play. And if there's any message I want to leave here, it is, we must all be on the one sheet, coming from a different perspective. Consensus around the challenges is extremely important. I remember asking Tony Blair one time when I met him uh, about the Middle East and was he making any progress and he said, Mary, you know, if you don't have a shared analysis of the problem, you ain't going to find a solution. And it's very true. We only solved the problem in Northern Ireland when we all shared a view of what the problem was. So unless we share a view of the problem and the challenge, and that should not be difficult because it's very obvious and some of the statistics we saw just a few moments ago could help inform us in that regard, we will not be able to come to a shared understanding of how we resolve it. In Ireland, we are big consumers of pharmaceutical products. We are big supporters of the pharmaceutical industry and the industry is very important in Europe. We know that at the moment about 10 million people a year die because of the failure of antibiotics. And some of the simple procedures like hip and knee operations, which are quite simple nowadays, will not happen in the future unless we can deal with the antibiotic issue. It's a real challenge. We know too that for every five to 10,000 compounds that go into discovery, only one, one results in a new therapy. And that can take from 11 to 18 years. We know too that only two out of every 10 branded uh, products ever pay, repay their R&D costs. We know that the average cost of a new therapy is about $2 billion. These are mega sums. 
If we want the innovation to continue, we have to be on the agenda of what innovation we need. We're very fastly moving into the area of personalized medicine. And I'm a strong fan of personalized medicine and value-based healthcare. Michael Porter has said, if we pay for value only, we could have the health budgets in the developed world. Um, research has shown, for example, in the United States, the Rand Institute, that for the top 30 acute conditions, 50% of the procedures were not based on evidence. In other words, they were not the right procedures. We know, too, that 50% of patients stop taking their medication in accordance with the drug regime within six months. A huge waste of money and leads to bad outcomes. In the US in 2009, they said it was 295 billion, or 13% of their budget. We saw some research recently in Sweden that showed the difference between the good performance and the bad performance on cataract surgery was 30% variation. In the US on heart failure, it was 40%. I mention these statistics because a huge amount of money is being expended and the patients and society is not getting value. We are moving to an era where personalized medicine will become the norm, where the diagnostic tools, the electronic records, the ICT and the monitoring and evaluation and all the things that are needed to make that happen are a long way off. I think it's only by having events like this where you bring together industry, people from the regulatory bodies, from the hopefully from the Ministry for Health, I don't know that. Uh, we all need to talk to each other. We need to engage with each other. And the media too have a role to play, and it's great that Ethos is sponsoring this event, because information and education is badly needed by our society and patients. People often uh, suffer under the myth that if the doctor doesn't give them a, pres a prescription, he's not doing his job. One of the most common things general practitioners used to say to me in Ireland, if you, if you don't give the patient a prescription, they feel you're letting them down, when very often they may not need a prescription. So we need to change the way we organize our health service, prevention, early intervention, reorganization of care, and above all else, empowering the patients. Ladies and gentlemen, it's truly a pleasure for me to be here on behalf of the European Steering Group. Uh, we would be delighted to share our white paper with you, uh, which we published last year. It's available online for any of you any of you that would like to hear about it, or indeed if you want to hear about some of the wonderful 30 pilot projects that are delivering fantastic innovation at a very localized level. But our plan is to mainstream and scale up that innovation and make it a reality for all Europeans. Thank you.